Hello, my name is Ryan Grecki. I'm going to tell you about a patient I worked with who had significant impairments after his stroke. We'll discuss the barriers I encountered while trying to implement the recommended action statements of the Vocomotor CPG, and also identify available knowledge translation tools that help address those barriers. The patient in this case is a 50-year-old male who had a left MCA stroke 12 years prior to us evaluating him in our outpatient clinic. After his stroke, he was able to achieve a limited household ambulator status using a quad cane. However, in recent years, he has not walked due to some social issues and subsequent functional decline. And he just recently moved in with his very supportive mother. This slide describes his mobility function and initial outcome measures, for which he scored a zero except for the Berg, where he was able to sit independently and transfer with the assistance of one person. Regarding the patient status across the ICF domains, he did have significant right hemiplegia and complete sensory loss, along with a right visual field cut. His elderly mother assisted him with nearly dependent transfers, and he was not able to walk or negotiate stairs. And due to his mobility deficits, he complained of not being able to attend family functions, largely due to barriers of stairs and unfamiliar toilets. Mr. E.C. and his mother's initial goals were to pursue a power wheelchair, improve the assist level for transfers, and maybe try walking again. And after discussing our plan of care, Mr. EC was agreeable to trialing a bout of therapy that was to specifically focus on walking function. Our intervention selection was largely guided by the 2020 Locomotor Clinical Practice Guideline for ambulatory patients with chronic neurologic injuries, including stroke. While our patient didn't fit perfectly into the population under study, we still felt the CPG could apply to our patient since he was well into the chronic stage of stroke, he was previously ambulatory after his stroke, and he had a goal of recovering walking function. We aimed to implement the CPG's first action statement, specifically providing gait training at cardiovascular intensities above 70% of max heart rate. Our plan of care was to see Mr. E.C. twice a week for one hour long sessions and expected to work with him for eight to 12 weeks pending his response to therapy. Our visit frequency was limited by our clinic schedule availability and we targeted intensity to be between 70 and 85% of age predicted max heart rate. And we only wanted to practice walking to maximize specificity and repetition. Throughout our plan of care, we experienced three main types of barriers. They included safety, how we would optimally monitor intensity via heart rate, and therapist beliefs. Implementing high intensity gait training requires therapists to ensure patient safety, which includes vital sign monitoring before and during treatment. This very handy vital sign parameter guideline is available on the CPG's webpage. Our patient, Mr. EC, actually had resting blood pressures well over what's considered safe to initiate exercise. So we actually had to postpone initiating our plan of care by a month while we got in touch with his primary care provider and got Mr. EC and his family on board with improving their medication compliance. Another safety consideration was that the patient was fairly dependent early on and required a good amount of physical assistance and he was at a high fall risk. To mitigate the risk of potential injury to both the patient and myself as his therapist, we chose to start most of our training sessions using an overhead harness system as seen here. In this early video, we are specifically focusing on limb advancement and stance control, providing physical assist only as needed intermittently for limb advancement, and more heavy assistance for stance control to prevent severe knee hyperextension. No body weight support was provided, the harness was just used for safety. 
Though it may not look like much, you can see that the patient is achieving the higher cardiovascular intensity we were targeting. And initially, our patient re would require a rest break after 30 to 60 seconds of stepping. During those rest breaks, we were able to check his blood pressure to ensure it was staying in a safe range. And as his walking tolerance improved, we tried to minimize rest breaks. We controlled for the patient's propulsion and balance deficits by providing upper extremity support on the railings. And to further target limb advancement, we provided a ball as an external focus of attention, which you can see for some steps resulted in improved limb advancement. And you'll see that the patient remains in the target heart rate zone. Beyond improving safety, the use of a harness system decreased our patient's fear of falling. It allowed him to get more stepping repetition and had the added benefit of requiring fewer staff members while working with him. The website also has this great resource document, which provides several options for overhead harness and unweighting systems. This is a snapshot of the first page. We also recognize that not all facilities have access to overhead harness systems, and that supervisor and administrator support can be a barrier. That's why we created this document, justifying an investment in an overhead harness system. It aims to answer some of the key questions, such as, do I need a harness to provide best care? Aren't gate belts enough? Does a lack of equipment pose a risk to therapists? And what is the potential return on investment of an overhead harness system? And again, this document can be found on the Voco Motor CPG webpage. Now, if we're going to be targeting 70 to 85% of max heart rate during our gait training, we need to be able to quickly and easily identify the appropriate target range for our patients. Factors such as age, resting heart rate, and whether a patient is on beta blocker medication will impact that target range. The website includes several easy to use resources to help you quickly identify an appropriate training range. And one of those resources is the Heart Rate Calculator Excel Spreadsheet. This is easily downloadable to any computer to maximize clinician workflow. There's also a great short video that shows you how to use that calculator. And for our patient, Mr. EC, we wanted to target between 121 and 147 beats per minute. To optimize heart rate monitoring, we recommend using a continuous heart rate monitor. This screenshot is from the first page of a document on the website, which lists a variety of continuous heart rate monitoring device options, along with insights into some of their pros, cons, price points, and their website links. This next video was taken in the final month of therapy. At this point, the patient's heart rate would not achieve our target zone while we were just walking at a self-selected overground speed. So here we try to show some strategies for getting your patient into the target zone. Here we are challenging propulsion while gradually increasing treadmill speed. You'll notice that the patient is now wearing a knee cage to protect his knee from hyperextension and assist with stance control. And you can see the patient is in his target zone. Next are examples of targeting balance on compliant floor mats while challenging him to finish the obstacle course in a certain amount of time while we count down out loud, which shifts his attention to an external focus and increases motivation. Stair negotiation is another strategy to get into the target heart rate zones. Stairs still focus on stepping practice while also challenging limb advancement and stance control. Even if people don't have stairs they have to negotiate at home, practicing stairs during therapy is a great way to target a variety of deficits. And while it may not look like much, the patient is indeed achieving the targeted higher cardiovascular intensities. And in a moment, you'll be able to see that, the, that we're using a continuous heart rate monitoring device. And such a device makes it really easy to gauge where the patient's heart rate is in the moment. Finally, using a resistance band, we provide a challenge to propulsion and follow it with intervals of fast walking practice. And remember, throughout all of our gait training, we are monitoring our patient's heart rate response, 
his subjective reports, and assessing his performance to ensure that we're providing an appropriate level of challenge while keeping him safe. There are also a variety of belief barriers therapists may experience when trying to implement high intensity gait training. For example, when we consider the four key active ingredients that came out of the clinical practice guideline, optimizing specificity and repetition leaves little room for practicing other skills. So a therapist might rightly ask, what about transfer and balance goals our patient has? Shouldn't we spend time also practicing those and not just focusing on walking? This journal club guide we developed tries to answer this and other common therapist belief barriers related to high intensity gait training. This guide expands to literature that is beyond and or published since the CPG was released and could be helpful to provide context to the CPG's first action statement. As an example, one section of the guide looks at the concept of skill transference. In this section, recommended papers are provided with direct links along with guiding questions for therapists to consider while reviewing the papers. Interestingly, several studies have suggested that despite not explicitly practicing transfers and balance, high intensity gait training often results in carryover to transfers and balance gains. This skill transference can provide therapists with reassurance that focusing on intensive gait training is unlikely to neglect other domains like transfers and balance. There is also a great podcast available that specifically talks about common therapist belief barriers, along with providing recommendations from personal experiences on how to address them. Back to our patient case, this chart illustrates the changes in Mr. EC's capacity measures from initial eval to discharge and a three-month follow-up reassessment. You can note significant clinically meaningful changes in all outcome measures, which were maintained at the follow-up. And despite only practicing walking, improvements beyond walking function were obtained you can see the patient experienced skill transference to transfer and balance function measured with the five times sit to stand and Berg balance scale. Regarding outcomes outside of the clinic, Mr. EC's mother frequently remarked how excited she was that she no longer had to physically help him with transfers, especially on and off the toilet. She and Mr. EC also reported he was now walking independently inside his home using his cane and even performed stairs with supervision. His improvements in stairs and toilet transfers allowed him to leave his home more easily and access other family members' homes, whereas stairs and unfamiliar toilets were previously barriers to attending family functions. Finally, the patient's goals were met recovering household walking function, and even no longer pursuing a power wheelchair. This slide is gonna compare videos from very early on in his plan of care, and then later in discharge. So this first video you saw before, so just a refresher of where he started, we'll let that one play. So you're needing a lot of, lots of assistance, very impaired and slow. And then in the discharge video, you can appreciate how different his level of assistance is, how much more functional he is, and even his improved gait quality, despite that not being a focus of our training. Here's a summary of the resources that we've discussed in the context of this patient case. Remember, you can find all of these on the Vocal Motor CPG's website.